Okay, so yesterday we discussed the gen uh, general idea of renormalization. In particular, renormalization of theories with global symmetry. And we saw that while in general, renormalization demands that you have to add all operators of dimension less than or equal to 4, okay, or in d dimensions, all operators of dimension less than or equal to d. Sometimes you may relax this if there is a symmetry. Okay, if there is a symmetry, then you have to add all operators that are inside and under that particular symmetry. So today we will apply this idea to renormalization of gauge theories. And as I have already said, the main problem in applying these ideas to gauge theories is that the gauge fixed action doesn't have the gauge invariance. So in general, we cannot expect that we, we can use gauge invariance to uh, decide what kind of counter trumps we may be needed because the Feynman rules are not invariant under the gauge theory. So the question is, how do we proceed? So let me remind you that the Total action in a gauge theory is a sum of three kinds of terms. The first kind of term is a gauge invariant terms. Then there is gauge fixing term. And then there is host. So gauge invariant terms include the gauge field kinetic terms, okay, the coupling of the gauge fields to fermions, coupling of the gauge fields to scalars, coupling of scalars among themselves, fermions to scalars, and so on. Okay, all kinds of terms. But they are all gauge invariant by themselves. The gauge fixing term has the structure Well, you can. So the point is, if you want manifest renormalizability, you have to make sure that you don't get operators of hard dimension larger than four. So that's something that you have to choose. If you don't, if you add operators of dimension larger than four, then the manifest renormalizability will, will be lost. Physical quantities, of course, shouldn't change, so they should still be finite. But in general, optical Green's functions will not be finite. So this is the general structure of the gauge fixing term. HS are some. Uh, set of functions that you use to uh, fix your gauge. Okay. And a standard example that we have considered is H A if you are to del nu Okay, the number of such functions is the same as the number of gauge transformation products. And then we wrote down the general expression for the ghost action. So maybe write, let me write this. So S ghost, what is the structure of S ghost? This is given by minus, this is minus sign is a matter of convention, but I have used it here. symbol here, 
just to denote that theta is a collection of many variables. So what is this object? So H A theta, H A theta is the transform of theta, transform of H A of H A under H transform of with parameters theta a. Okay, and these of course can be functions of space and board. Okay, this was a general structure of the host action that we had written down. So the form of the host action depends on what gate fixing function you have chosen. Question. And this, because we are taking the derivative and we are evaluating it at theta equal to zero, basically we need to know to calculate this, we need to know how H transforms under infinitesimal gauge transform. Right? Where after taking the derivative, we will set the parameter to zero. Right? So only we need to know what happens to H when you make a small uh, gauge transform. So let me work out an example. <coughs> so, for example, the gauge transformation laws of the gauge field. This we have derived after you have suitably normalized various fields. And here I am using the convention that A, A, B, C is totally anti-symmetric in A, B, and C. Okay. We saw that this requires that you have to normalize the generators appropriately. Okay. This TATB is half the entire B. Okay. If you use, otherwise, A, B, C is anti-symmetric in the first two index, but not in the last index. But if you normalize that this TATB is delta A, B, or proportional to delta A, B, then this is totally anti-symmetric. Okay. And I will assume that I have cho chosen that convention. So this is the transformation law for the gauge fields. And now, now we can see what happens. So what is the of theta? So delta of the H A. H of theta, let's say that is H of theta. This is given by at x. So this will be given by H A of x. Which is del mu A B F. Okay, let's choose del mu A B F. Plus del del x mu. Let me now write x. We will we'll introduce another coordinate. So let me write a del del x mu of minus del theta A del x mu. For well, there is a Index loading and as a which means what variable plus g f a b c theta b of x a b c of x all of these are x. Okay. I've just substituted this del mu a mu a. I have the series of part that AMU transforms to this under a small gate of gate chart. So delta H A theta of X, delta theta B of Y. You can easily calculate from here, right? Because all you have to do is to take the derivative, function of the derivative with respect to theta B. Okay. So this gives you 
del del x mu of minus del del x mu of delta 4 x minus 1 delta a plus b x a b c delta do something with the object I should change this right delta a b c a b c I just took the functional derivative with respect to theta b of y. So because this is with respect to y, okay, I can move it freely back and forth through delta del x mu. So this is derivative with respect to x mu. So delta delta theta b y, okay, will directly act on this uh, delta theta of x. That gave you this delta 4 of x minus y. And similarly, I directly acted on this theta d of x. That gave you delta 4 of x minus y and delta b. Okay, this is something I have already seen before. I am just repeating what I have done earlier, right? Because you have explicitly derived the most action for this case. Anyway, so now we just substitute here. So what do you get? You get minus integral d4x, d4y, then b a of x, b a of x, then the next new, I use this delta function to say b equal to b now, a a b c, b f a b c, delta 4 of x minus y, Now, I can just simply take this d4y integral through all these derivatives with respect to x, and I get d4y delta 4 x minus y cb of y, right? So I can bring the cb of y inside the x derivative because this is y, this is x derivative, so I can bring cb of y inside. So I just get delta 4 x minus y cb of y integral d4y, so just, instead of delta 4 x minus y, I just get a cb of x here. Similarly here, I bring the CB of Y here and instead of delta 4 of X minus Y, I get a CB of X here. So the final thing, or the semi-final thing, is integral D4 X. Y integral has been done, so D A of X. And now we get minus box X, D A of X, plus G A A B C. And I'll just add one more step. We just integrate by second one, you integrate by part. So this minus sign, this cancel, this minus sign. 
Once you integrate by part, you get a minus sign which cancels this. So integral d4x dx box x dx is in a whole function of x plus integral plus d f a b c integral d4x del d a. Right, so this is something that I derived earlier. This is a Gauss kinetic term, and this is the interaction of the Gauss field with the end. So I have written down the gauge in the gauge fixing term and the gauge uh, and the ghost action. I have given the general expression, I have given spatial expressions okay, when the gauge fixing function is del mu a mu. So let me also write down for a few of the terms in the gauge invariant action. Okay, so that you get some idea of what kind of terms you have to deal with. SGI gain invariant has a term of the following form minus one quarter integral d4x a k mu nu a k mu nu where a k mu nu is del mu a mu a minus del mu a mu a plus a k mu nu Again, just keep in mind that you have absorbed some factors of g inside the gauge field, okay? Because the original form that we wrote down had a minus one over four g squared, and no g here, right? But then you saw that by scaling, uh, uh, putting g inside a, we can get a term like this, okay? And this is more suitable for uh, doing perturbation theory because now you can see that the interaction terms are accompanied by factors of g. Now I'll leave it as an exercise. To check that in four dimensions, in D equal to four, we have the dimension of A mu is one. Okay, which is actually not very hard to see. Okay, just look at the kinetic term and we can calculate the dimension. Dimension of A mu is one. Dimension of the B and C okay, are somewhat ambiguous. And the reason is, okay, you can see that the only terms in the action where B and C appear are always in the product B and C. Okay? So you cannot determine dimensions of B and C independently. So what we can do is that we can label this as 1 minus lambda and B of CA as 1 plus lambda. Lambda can be any arbitrary number. The final result doesn't really uh, depend on what lambda you choose. Okay, because BC always appears in this combination. Some of dimensions will be true. Right? Because that's what you get. Some of dimensions is true because this has dimension two, so it has to, it has to add up to dimension two, right? So the total dimension is uh, four. In arbitrary dimension, yeah, we can work on what it is, right? Some appropriate uh, number. So commonly one chooses this to be one each, okay, but it's not necessary. Okay, the general structure is one minus lambda and one plus lambda. What is the dimension of G?
that is then determined from this. So this has the, what is the dimension of this term? Not zero. This has one. This is del del x mean, right? So this is two. Okay, del del x. So this is two. This is two. So this will also have dimension two. So these are dimension one each. Right? So these dimension zero. So this is zero. I'll leave as an exercise to check that for H A, if we take to be del mu del mu A, then dimension of this alpha inverse is also zero. So alpha inverse is what appears as a parameter, right? That's why I'm counting dimension of alpha inverse. Because I have written the kinetic term as one over or the gauge fixing term as one over two alpha times h square. It's not hard to see, right? Because the LU AMU has dimension two, when you square it, it has a dimension four, right? So the corresponding coefficient will have dimension zero. Okay. And in general, I like again leave it as an exercise to check that all terms <coughs> have dimension less than or equal to, sorry, dimension, yeah, less than or equal to four. If SGI has that property. See, SGI, of course, I mean, you don't know what SGI is, right? Because you, uh, it's some gauge invariant action. So, there, if you want, you can certainly add terms of dimension larger than 4. Okay, take trace f minus square and square it again, right? That is the gauge invariant object, you can add it to the action, but that will not be very normalizable theory. Okay. So SGI at least has to have all terms of dimension less than or equal to 4. Okay. Once you do that, then with this choice of gauge fixing uh, function, okay, and there are other general uh, class of choices, as long as HA is made of dimension 2 operators, okay, you can uh, verify that all terms in the action will have dimension less than or equal to 4. So this means that this action will pass the first criteria for renormalizability. Okay. So pass is the first criterion for renormalization. Pass is first All terms in the action have dimension four or less. The problem comes in the second criteria. Because the second criteria tells us that you have to add everything of dimension less than or equal to four. And you can easily convince yourself that you have not added everything that has dimension less than or equal to four. Okay, so I'll just give some examples. These are dimension 4, right? B plus C add up to 2, A has dimension 1. So this is dimension 4 operator. This is something that you have not added to the action. So the action doesn't have any term like this. Right? The ghosts have only BC and the BCA term. Right? No BCA term. This means that there is also no counter term of this structure. Right? Since there is no coupling, there is nothing to renormalize, so there is a counter term. And that means what? That means that if we have a Green's function, which B, C, and 2 A's, and if it is divergent, there is nothing to cancel it. Right? So if we take a Green's function of the form, This is B C A A. Mm -hmm. 
if this has divergence, you cannot cancel it. And you expect this to have divergence, a graph like this to have divergence, simply because of the fact that the total dimensions add up to 4. Okay, and you had seen earlier that whenever the total dimensions add up to 4 or less, the corresponding graph can be divergent by power counting. But let me give some examples, specific example of a graph, right? Take this graph. Gauge field can couple to the host, right? DCA coupling is there. Okay. So now let's take So now you see how many parts of momentum, two parts from here in the denominator, right? one over k square from the A, then BC propagator has again one over k square, right? So one over k square, one over k square, one over k square, okay? That's altogether eight parts of k in the denominator. How many in the numerator? Each vortex, the gauge field, ECA vortex, as a derivative, right? It's del mu b. Remember that there's a derivative in the DC of vortex, right? So if we just do the counting of derivatives, then naive counting will give you one, two, three, four derivatives. So four parts of momentum. So naively you think that this is divergent. There's a naive power counting. Eight parts of momentum in the denominator, four parts in the numerator, and then four from integration. Before k. So then you have to worry about what cancels, what can possibly cancel this divergence. Okay, if this di diagram is divergent, then what can cancel it? Yes. Sir, cannot be in the external. Well, as a, at the level of the Green's functions, the host can be in the external leg, right? Ultimately, when you are considering the uh, final amplitude, the host cannot be in the external leg. But this could be sitting inside a sub big diagram, right? The sub diagram is divergent, right? Is that yeah? If the sub diagram is divergent, right, then it is true that in the physical amplitude the host cannot be on the external thing. But you can certainly consider a loop like this with all kinds of other particles getting attacked, right? But you still have to worry about whether this could become right. Uh, well, they can be external or internal, right? But all I'm saying is that this diagram, by naive power counting, this sub-diagram is divergent, right? So even if the external momentum are fixed, they are not becoming large. Okay, the naive power counting would say that this becomes divergent. Gauge lines, if those are external, <laughs> then by uh, since there is a gauging variance, so one should expect that. See, that's the point is there is no gauging variance in the gauge fixed action. Yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah, I mean, uh, in the S matrix, one should expect that should be gauging variance, right? In the S matrix, yes. Yeah. So there, there if those two uh, gauge field lines are external, then uh, from the gauge invariance, one should expect that. Uh, Suppose k1 mu k2 mu, such kind of terms in the. Well, this could be internal. This could be connected to some pair of particles like this, for example, right? Yeah, yeah. Then, uh, then, then the problem. Okay. The point is the way we have proved normalizability, right? By doing this naive dimension analysis, right? that breaks down. Yeah. Of course, something has to cure it, right? I mean, if if the uh, analysis, if, if the gauge story has to be normalizable, then even if this diagram is divergent, there will be something else which you also have to add to it, and maybe eventually it will become uh, convergent, right? But it's just that at this level, okay, it looks divergent by naive power counting. So, okay, and that you could see because this is dimension 4. So, okay, this is just the fact that you have equal parts of momentum in the numerator and denominator is just a reflection of the fact that this is dimension 4. Is this But there is actually another kind of problem. Now, this is just one example of 
some terms which could appear but doesn't appear. Okay, but there are other examples you can write down. The other kind of problem is that many of the couplings are related. So let me write down some of the couplings that follow from this action. And that's minus half E, F, A, B, C. Okay. Minus half E, F, A, B, C. This will be one of the terms that come from the cross term between this and this. Okay. When you say the cross term, you get a term of this term. Then there is another kind of term, which is minus one quarter e squared f a b c f a b c. That comes from basically the square of this. Okay, when you calculate the same if we do if we square this, that gives you the of this guy. Then there is a coupling of the ghost to, uh, to the gives this A B C then mu B of X. Now the problem is that all of these have the same coupling, Z, G, right? So which means that when you derive the expression for the counter terms for these kinds of couplings, they will involve the same renormation constant Z, right? Wave function renormation of course will be fixed at previous state, okay, by just from two point function, okay? but from the three point function and the four point function of the gauge fields and the gauge field goes to three point function. We can see that by adjusting the same ZG, we have to cancel all the divergences. Okay. So what does that mean? Okay, this means that if we have a, diver a, a graph like this, three gauge fields joining into a body, right? or four gauge fields joining into a body, okay. or Gauge field joining into a gauge vortex. All of these have to be cured by adjusting one Riemannian constant z. Is this is clear. This is similar to what the situation that we encountered yesterday, right? That we had this lambda, and there are two defined kinds of couplings, and by adjusting the same z lambda, we have to Cancel the divergences in both set of graphs, right? Phi 1, phi 1, phi 1, phi 1, and phi 1, phi 1, phi 2, phi 2. Here, it's a similar story, right? Adjusting one ZG, you have to be able to cancel the divergences in all of these, which means that somehow the divergences in all of these must be related, right? That whatever divergence term you get from here must be related to the divergence that comes here and the divergence that comes here, right? Only then there is a hope that by adjusting the same di ZG, we can cancel all of this. Yeah, 
Well, up to order, 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 order of momentum also because these are the counter terms, right? So this counter term, for example, is a momentum dependence. Just for the dimension, dimension analysis, you can see up to what order in momentum you have to expand, right? This one is this a zero momentum term because it already has dimension four. Right? These ones you have to expand to first order in momentum. Right? It can be divergent up to linear uh, order in expansion, right? Because this has dimension three. This also has dimension three, right? so these will be divergent up to linear order in momentum, and that you can also see from the structure of the counter term, right? Because the structure of the vortex, there's a derivative sitting here, and then a derivative sitting here, but there's no derivative sitting here. Just a typo. Yes. Yeah, there, uh, let, yeah. F A B C in the first yes. line. F A B C. A B A B mu A C mu. The first line. The first term. Oh, yes. first term. Yeah. F A B C. A oh, A B C. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Also, the indices. Will be yeah. See, the gauge indices. I am not worried. Yeah. These indices will be. Out. Gauge indices. You just raise and lower by delta. Okay, so I'm not worried about raising and lowering gauge indices. Okay, what a vector indices, yes, indeed they have to do it now. Is this clear? Yeah. So this is the puzzle, right? How can gauge theory be renormalizable if there are all these relations which do not seem to follow from some symmetry? Okay. And the problem is that gauge symmetry, I mean, how are these two related, right? After all, these two got related because of the gauge symmetry, right? Because the fact that you have to square this and not something else, is a consequence of gauge symmetry. This one doesn't have any manifest gauge symmetry. Right? This didn't came, came from yeah. covalentizing the free action. Yeah. This came from the gauge fixing and then we introduced hosts and so on. The problem is that the gauge, gauge symmetry is actually not there in the yeah. gauge fixed action. So you cannot say that gauge invariance will protect you from the, the divergences here and here, and here should be the same, that should follow as a consequence of gauge invariance. Right? Because gauge invariance is simply not there as part of the uh, gauge fixed action. Yeah. So like yesterday we had the symmetry that helped us. Exactly. We had a symmetry that helped us. That symmetry was the symmetry of the action. Right? So if we had a symmetry of the action that told us that we have added all the terms of dimension 4 or less with that symmetry, right? then we would be done. Right? Then we can say that that symmetry then will relate the divergences yes. in these graphs. Such that the same grade you can cancel all of them. So the question is, what is such a symmetry? Is there such a symmetry? It is not gauge symmetry, but is there such symmetry of the gauge fixed action which you can use to say that these divergences are all related? So the same that you will have to cancel that also. If, that, if you add a formula, for example, right, then the gauge field coupling to a pair of formulas will also involve three. So then the same that you have to cancel that, that, that divergence. Right? Everything has to be cancelled. Why say everything? That is true. So this will involve ZG, this will involve ZG square. Right? But with the same ZG that you have to add. Okay, so ZG is one plus something, right? So basically, it will, if this is if ZG is one plus something, this will be one plus two times something to the first order. Right? But the number of independent constants are not increasing, right? So you have the same set of independent constants that you have to adjust to cancel all these divergences. Is this okay? Because it turns out that there is indeed such a symmetry, and that's called the BRSP symmetry. So 
So this will be a symmetry of the gauge fixed action. Okay. And under general uh, circumstances conditions, one can argue that the gauge fixed action contains all the terms that are invariant under VRS symmetry. Provided the gauge invariant part of this action contains all the gauge invariant terms of dimension length are equal to 4. That is something that we have to impose. Okay, that the gauge invariant part of the action must contain all terms of dimension less than or equal to 4. Then we are ensured that we have added all terms which are invariant under the BIS system. Okay, so what I'll do, so I'll describe what this symmetric term total is. So all terms meaning containing scalar, polynomial. Meaning if you have a certain set of fields, Right? Given a certain set of fields. Yeah, given a certain set of fields, you have to add all terms with those many fields, right? So for example, suppose you have a charge scalar, right? You add d mu phi dagger d mu phi. But you don't add phi dagger phi whole square. Right? That would not be consistent. Okay, because phi dagger phi whole square is also gauge invariant. Right? And it's a dimension four. Right? So you have to add phi dagger phi whole square. Is it clear? Right? So this because that's gauge invariant, right? And we will see that that adding gauge invariant terms to the action doesn't spoil BRS invariants. Okay, so those terms will also turn out to be BRS invariants for themselves. Okay, I have not described how the symmetric transforms in acts, but it will turn out that BRS invariants, if you add just gauge invariant terms to the action, they are automatically remain BRS invariants. So this is an infinitesimal transformation. Okay, so what I have to say do is to give you how it acts on various rules. Okay. So this is an infinitesimal transformation, infinitesimal transformation. It's global symmetry, its transformation parameter doesn't depend on x. And it has another peculiar peculiar property that the transformation parameter is actually a grass one value property. Okay, it's not a normal bosonic uh, 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 variable, okay. but it's a Grassmann variable. So increase this transformation labeled by by a Grassmann value factor z. Grassmann Which means so if you have a grass one field, okay. then whether zeta is to the left or right gives a minus sign. Okay. Zeta times B, for example, B is grass one value, right? B is anti commuting So zeta times B A is minus B A times zeta. So there is something I have to keep in mind. So now let me say how the VRS symmetry acts. So delta B of gauge fields and matter fields, gauge or matter fields, is equal to the gauge transformation of gauge or matter fields. With parameter <coughs> zeta, zeta, zeta. Okay, so I'll illustrate this by some example. Pardon? Yeah, so theta a will be, you, you take a gauge transformation and replace theta a by zeta times theta of x. Okay, that's the way BRS system attracts on the various matter fields. Okay, matter fields means some gauge fields or matter fields, not a ghost fields. So, for example,
डेल्टा गेज ऑफ रेडियो दिस वॉज माइनस डेलम्यू थीटा है प्लस डी एफ ए बी सी थीटा बी ऑफ एक्स एलू सी ऑफ एक्स है This was the transformation law for gauge fields. So the BRC transformation law of the gauge fields, delta V of mu will be minus del mu of beta T of x plus T F A B C beta C B of x. Here, of course, the zeta I can take outside because so zeta doesn't depend on x. Okay, so it's zeta del mu c of x, and then d f a b c zeta c b a b c. I just replace theta a by theta times a. That's the rule. So this is the general infinitesimal transformation. With, yeah. With, with the parameter. Exactly. Take a general infinitesimal transformation of any field and replace the parameter by theta times a. Okay. So let me give another example. So suppose psi. Suppose psi goes to Some representation R of u times psi. Okay, general it transforms in some representation. Now for infinitesimal, for infinitesimal, it's given by one minus i g theta i r a of theta. On side, right? This is the way we had labeled R of u. Again, because we absorb some factors of g inside theta, there is an explicit g, right? We did both in our earlier analysis that we, the initial we didn't have this g to begin with, but then we renormalize, we normalize theta so that a g comes out of the theta. That has to do with the fact that there is a g sitting here. Okay, so this gives you delta gauge of psi. Delta gauge of psi is minus i g theta a of x r a psi of x. So delta b of psi will be given by minus i g. Will prove that uh, it is a symmetry, right? Like now, it's just a statement of how the symmetry transformation acts, right? But then we will see why it's a symmetry of the full action. And why is this? Yeah, this is just defined like this, right? That the g is the same g, and that g is the same g with g. So that this coupling g. Yes, this and coupling g. That you just take the the way the gauge transformation acts on a given field. And replace the gauge parameter by zeta times c, right? That's the rule. Yes. Yes. So for the gauge invariant part, it is essentially gauge transformation, except that the gauge transformation parameter is not an arbitrary function of x, right? but it's zeta times c of x. Well, 
I have not told you how the host field is transformed, right? So we don't know yet if this is symmetric of the full action encoded in the host. But the idea is that you have to now give the transformation of the host fields so that it becomes a symmetry of the full action including the host. Host part. Okay, but right now I have just, gi I have just given so far how the various matter fields and the gauge fields transform. So this is, I have not fully specified how the YS fields transform, right? So the host fields have to be specified, right? How the host fields transform under the RSP But already at this stage, you can see that SGI is BRST invariant. <coughs> SGI is BRST invariant. Why? Theta is arbitrary. Yeah, theta was arbitrary. Right? SGI was gain invariant. Right? So now we are just taking a special, um, making a special choice of theta, right? Which is theta times C R X. So it's also obviously the RSC invariant. Right? And this is the reason why we can add to SGI any term that is gain invariant, it remains the RSC invariant. Right? And so by requiring that we have to add everything, all dimension less than or equal to four terms which are the RST invariant means that you have to add to SGI all dimension less than or equal to four terms which are gauge invariant. Is that clear? If you miss out some terms which are gauge invariant in SGI and have dimension less than or equal to four, then those terms are also BRST invariant that you have missed out. So then the BRST symmetry is not enough to prove renormalizability. Right? Because if you are going to use BRST symmetry to prove renormalizability, you have to make sure that you have added everything that is BRST invariant and have dimension less than or equal to four. So this, you have to keep in mind that realist invariance can help us only if you have Context. added in the gauge invariant action all the terms that are gauge invariant, okay, which are less than dimension less than or equal to four. Yes. 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 They respect realist invariance, but then the power counting normalizer will break down, right? So then we'll generate all ki all infinite number of um, uh, terms, higher dimensional terms, which you have to renormalize. So uh, exactly. Because the point is the first criteria for renormalizability will break down. Right? The first criteria of renormalizability is that you have to only add terms which are dimension less than or equal to four. Right? See, you have to satisfy all these criteria, right? So it is true that if you add Gauge invariant terms which have dimension higher than 4, okay. it will still be BRSC invariant. Okay. But it doesn't satisfy the false criteria. Okay, so that's why you have to restrict two terms of dimension less than or equal to 4. Is this okay? Okay. Now the gauge fixing term, we can find how it transforms. Right? Because uh, it involves only the matter fields. The edge fixing term doesn't involve host fields, right? So without knowing how the host transform, we can figure out how the gauge fixing terms, terms transform. And that is definitely not BRST invariant. Because it's not gauge invariant. Right? By construction, gauge fixing term is not gauge invariant. So it's not a BRST invariant. Okay? So let's work out how the gauge fixing term transforms. Okay? Because ultimately you want to cancel that by assigning appropriate transformation not to the hosts. So let's look at how the gauge fixing term transforms. So delta B of S here is minus one over two alpha delta B integral for X. Now I should have said that in all that I am doing here, the proof of BRST invariant, the dimension really doesn't play any role. I could have replaced d4x by ddx. Okay, the proof of BRST invariant should still be. 
So this is minus one over alpha integral d four x delta b of a t of x times a t. Okay, I have to take variation of this as well as this. Okay, what is the square? So I just use that to cancel. Now, using the fact that the BRST transformation is the same as gauge transformation, okay, but with the parameter which is theta times uh, C A, I can write this as minus one over alpha. claim is that delta b of h a is given by this one. So what are we doing here? That we are taking h a, making a gauge transformation by parameter theta, arbitrary parameter theta. That's the definition. That's a c of theta, right? We take the derivative with respect to theta b of y, functional derivative. And then, because we are trying to evaluate it, when theta b of y is given by zeta cb of y, I multiply by zeta cb of y. Okay, and then integrate over d4 y. Okay, so that's what gives us how h a will transform under the transform. Okay, that you pretend as if it's a gauge transformation. Okay. If it has a gauge transformation, the only difference is that here, instead of zeta cb, we have a theta b. Okay. We pretend as if it's a gauge transformation, but we, at the end, we replace the gauge transformation parameter by zeta cb. Okay. Is it here? Yeah, there's a d4y because this, this derivative will give a delta 4 of x minus y basically, right? Because the h a of theta will involve a theta a of x. Right? When you take the functional derivative, we'll get a delta 4 of x minus y. So that's why you need an integral d4 of y. Right? It's like we are, when you try to vary, say, if you have a function of many variables, right? Delta of f is del f del xi times delta xi, right? You have to sum over all i. And in this case, the sum over i also involves integration over y. Right? That's, that's the origin of this d4 y, right? Just here, just as you are summing over d, you are also integrating over y. But at the end, of course, this will not have the integration over y because this is a delta function. Now you see that this is something that has appeared somewhere before, right? Where did it appear? In the ghost app, right? So there is a hope that by appropriately defining the transformation law for the ghost fields, we can cancel off this term. Okay. The host action has a B and then this term and the C. Okay. C is already there. Okay. So you have to define delta B in something so that this term gets cancelled off. Is that clear? Let me write a post action.
This was the structure of the whole stack. So you take delta E. And you see that, that so when you vary B, so the delta of this will come get contribution from three terms, right? One from delta B, one from delta of this, and one from delta of C. Okay. But when you vary B, the term that will get exactly cancels this. Right? This is H I can bring here, right? Zeta and H I can always bring here, right? I can bring zeta here, I can bring HA here. Okay. So that zeta HA is also <coughs> theta. Delta B is zeta HA, right? Rest of the terms are exactly as you have there. Pardon? Yes, yes, it will change. So I have just written the first term. Delta goes, there will be one term where delta B times this, right? that term, I'm claiming, cancels that. Okay. Then there will be two more terms, right? You have to vary this, and you have to vary this. Because C, I have not told you so far how it varies, right? So the idea is that you have to uh, assign a variation of C in such a way that it cancels off the variation of H. Is that clear? So then delta B of S matrix C plus S cos. We'll now have minus integral D4X, D4Y, 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 These are the two terms which remain. <laughs> now, from the structure of this, you can see that this part is made of only the matter fields. So the HO is made of matter fields. Right? You are calculating the gauge variation. That's also made up only matter fields. So this part is made of matter fields. So the delta B of this will be something times a C. Why? Because the matter fields, the, all transforms of matter fields, I have erased this, is gauge transformation by zeta times C. Right? So delta of this will have the structure of some matter field combination times zeta times C. Zeta times C. So there are two C's here. Is that clear? No. 
because this involves only matter fields, right? You have to vary it. Okay, one matter field at a time, whatever appears here. And the matter field variation is like a gauge field variation with parameter zeta times c. So it will be proportional to zeta times c with some index. So it will be like the structure is that this is some matter field combination times zeta c c. So if that has to cancel against this, this is only matter, right? Delta c must be proportional to c times c. Okay, that's the only way you can hope to cancel these two. Okay, this will this is proportional to c times c, so it better be the delta c is proportional to c times c. Okay. Pardon? Yes, so you take the derivative, evaluate theta equal to zero, so the theta dependence goes away. It now depends only on the matter phase. So there is no two c. Yeah. Now you have to transform it again, right? Because if you do this, set theta equal to zero, now you have to take some combination of matter fields, so that's some combination of matter fields, you now transform it by another gauge transformation and then set the gauge transformation parameter to be zeta times c. Okay, that's why it's like zeta c c. That's the structure will be. So then delta c must also have the structure of zeta c c. So I'll write down the transformation law and then we will see that how they cancel. Yes. Why? Yes, this is delta B of H A. Oh, yeah, yeah, because there is a one over two, right? And because there are two factors of H, right? You'll get uh, two identical terms. So that's that's what fact cancels this two over here. <coughs> claim is that the following transformation works. So we will not try to prove that with this transformation, this term gets cancelled. So let's look at the first term. Okay, because this is the harder one to analyze, right? This, this, so this will be pretty simple, right? Just substitute delta c. This is the one which is harder to analyze because this is delta b. You have to apply one more time gauge term. So the first term.
this. Yeah, that's what we'll, we'll try to show. So these cancels and works for any choice of C for choice of A. Right? For any given choice, for a fixed stage like A, they will tell you anyway. Of course, you can substitute and you can show. Then we will try to show this to for the other. Is it clear what we have done here? Because this was some function of the matter, right? Now, the realistic variation of this is, we have to take a gauge transform of this, right? So you took a gauge transform of this by another set of parameters, phi d, okay, differentiated. Evaluated it at phi equal to zero. And then multiplied by the corresponding gauge transform of the parameter, zeta c, okay, because we're taking the derivatives to phi d. And again, we integrate over d force set. But that's the sum, we have to sum over all indices. So this is the structure. Now you see that there is a potential conflict that this involves two derivatives of H. You have to do gauge transform twice. Okay? There's only delta and the theta, and then you have to do delta and the phi. This involves only one. Okay, so then one might wonder that how can this two be equal? Okay, because you are trying to prove now this this equality in general for arbitrary h. Okay. Now the reason that we can prove this is the following. So you see that if you look at what multiplies it, first of all you have x, y, z are all integrated variables, right? So let's focus on y and z. Y and Z are integrated variables. B and D are both summed over. Okay, D is here, D is there. Now, if you look at this structure there, you see this is anti-symmetric, anti-symmetric. Under B B X K and why is it explained? Because you can write as minus C B of Y C B of Z, right? And then if, if you exchange B D and Y and Z, right, it becomes again C D of Z C B of Y. Okay? So this product, because the ghosts are anti-commuting numbers and anti-commuting fields, this product is anti-symmetric in B D X under simultaneous exchange of B with D and under Y with Y with Z. So which means that in this, I can anti-symmetrize. Instead of just evaluating this, I can replace this by half of whatever appears here minus ED exchange and YZ exchange. Is this clear? Okay, normally, if you have a summed up variable, right? A i j, B i j. A i j is anti-symmetric. You can just pick the anti-symmetric part of B i j. Right? Here, instead of having just summed up variable, you have some a summation as an integration. Okay? But the philosophy is the same, right? We are summing over D and D and integrating over Y and Z. Okay? Because this part of the product is anti-symmetric under B D exchange and Y Z exchange. Okay? In this part. I can replace it by this minus the corresponding term with BD exchange and YZ exchange. Okay. And put a half here. Keep only one of the integrands. Keep only one of the integrands. Yeah, we can just keep this, of course. 
No, no, I mean, so if you have a new, a new menu, so you only keep uh, one part of it. So, okay, the wider integral. Yes. Can you keep just one of those integrals? No, no, we cannot do one of those integers because if you have something like sum over aij, bij, right? Yes, we replace bij as the anti symmetric part, but sum over ij still has to run over the whole whole set, right? We can try to make, uh, I mean, uh, uh, make the region of integration to half, okay, but not uh, remove the integral, right? But we will not try to uh, do anything with the integral, so we will just continue to integrate over the full space, okay? But we will anti symmetrize this. Because the C of the C D of Z C B of Y, right? Is minus C B of Y C D of Z. This is an anti this just exchange of positions, right? You become minus sign. Okay. Now if we exchange D D and Y Z, it comes up to the original form, right? Original product, except that there's a minus sign which has to be picked up. Okay. That's the reason why this product is anti symmetric. Is this okay? Yeah, and because this product is anti-symmetric, we are allowed to anti-symmetrize. Is there actually sure that the part, the previous factor and the previous factor depends only on x, right? So it doesn't care about y and z. See, everything else you have taken into account, right? d4y, d4z, okay? that's of course symmetric under y-z exchange. Okay? This is an x-dependent object, right? And then only have this factor and this factor. Zeta, of course, is just a constant, which you don't take any value. Right? So that's why only the anti symmetric in this part is good enough. Now, what is the advantage of this? Okay, we have just added one more term, right? But the advantage is that now you can, if you look at this, right, what is the effect of anti symmetrizing in under d goes to d exchange and y goes to z, z exchange? It's as if we are performing the gauge transformations in opposite order, right? First, we apply the gauge transformation level by dy and dz. See, whether you call it phi or theta, of course, doesn't really matter because these are dummy variables, right? We are setting phi equal to zero and theta equal to zero. The indices are relevant. You are first applying the gauge transformation dy, then dz, that's in this. Here, it's the opposite order. We are applying dy and then dz. Right? That's the difference. Okay, so the fact that you are calling this phi and that theta is totally irrelevant. You could call this phi and this theta. Okay, because ultimately you are setting theta equal to zero and phi equal to zero. Right? These are dummy variables. So effectively, what you have here is an anti-commutator. Is a, is a commutator of two gauge transformations. Right? In one case, we are applying the first gauge transformation first, then the second one. In the other case, we are applying the second one first, then the first one. Is this clear? And the anti commutator of two gauge transformations, of course, is another gauge transformation. Sorry, commutator of two gauge transformations is another gauge transformation. Right? So that gauge transformation will act with a single derivative on H. Okay? So that's the trick that we replace, we, because once you have gotten this as a commutator of two transformations, okay, we'll be able to express this as just a single gauge transformation, okay, which of course some factors, okay, because of the structure constants and all. And then we'll show that that factor exactly cancels this term for here, okay, what you get from here. Yes, this is just group property. Right? This is group property that you are, but then to apply a group property, you have to first bring it in the form of a commutator. Right? That it's as if you are applying gauge transformation number one first and then two, and then the other order, right? And then taking the difference. Right. Yes, this is B followed by D, and the other one is D followed by B. Right? If you follow exchange, right? it will be D first and then B. Well, Y and Z will have something to do. We'll see explicitly how they act. But Y and Z, I mean, they will get symmetry between Y and Z. Right? So the anti-symmetry will be essentially because of the BD. Okay? Because we will see that the 
See, when you apply this, right, this will pick up a delta 4 of x minus y and this will pick up a delta 4 of x minus a, right? So that product, of course, uh, is symmetric under y, z, x, change. right? Delta 4 of x minus z times delta 4 of x minus y. So the anti-symmetry will play a role because this is b, this is b. Yeah. So I'll not try to complete it today. Maybe I'll do it next time. But let me yeah. tell you the tricks. It is so. One is that we can directly use group theory okay, to calculate the commutator between two uh, uh, transformers. Okay. But that is a little too abstract. Okay, so it will be a little less abstract. But still, we'll try to uh, do it in a uh, somewhat easier way. So the idea is that this, once you have understood that this is a commutator, we know that this will be a single gauge transformation acting on HA. And what gauge transformation it is, shouldn't depend on what HA we have chosen. Right? If some gauge transformation acting on, acting on HA, that shouldn't depend on what HA we have chosen. So to determine what gauge transformation it is, we'll choose not HA but a simpler because the commutator, what the commutator is, doesn't depend on what it is acting on. Right? So we'll try to choose a simpler object okay. and try to evaluate the same thing. Okay, instead of HA. Is this clear? So simpler object, we can, we can take, for example, a field okay. which transforms in some representation R. Okay, transforms in HA is more complicated, right? Because the, uh, typically the mu not only has the representation but also there is an inhomogeneous stuff, right? The del mu theta, okay? that makes life a little more complicated. You can of course do it, take any HA, right? del mu mu that you have taken and you can explicitly evaluate what this is. Okay? But since you are trying to prove this in general, we try to use a general trick, okay? which is that we try to evaluate this commutator by applying it to some simple function okay? and then the same, whatever we get, the same thing we apply in our HA. Okay, once you determine what gauge transform it will be, it will be the same gauge transform independent of what HA is. Okay. So let me leave as an, ex an exercise. Okay, it's actually quite straightforward. Well, it can be FABC, it can be minus FABC, so you have to be careful, right? So that's, that's the... Okay, a factor you have to return it, right? All the delta functions of y minus z, x minus z, so those are the things you have to return it. Right? Otherwise, yes, it should be proportional to f, d, b something, right? Okay, that is clear. Yeah, because if there's a b and a d, right? But whether it's f, b, d or f, d, b, you have to worry about, right? That's why you apply it on some uh, low, uh, simpler field and determine the factor explicitly. Okay, so suppose, suppose, psi theta is 1 minus i g theta a i theta psi. This is how a field transforming in certain representation transforms right? and, a, and a that's psi theta. Okay. So now we calculate the same thing as given here, but H A theta replaced by psi, psi theta. No, these are the level of gauge transformation, right? Because psi has gotten out, so you don't have to worry about psi till the very end, right? I mean, you just think of it as a gauge transformation. So now calculate half of Four Z before Y.
Okay, this is what you are supposed to calculate. All, all I have done is that I have replaced instead of H A theta of x, I have used <coughs> psi theta of x. Okay, H A has been replaced by psi. But once you express this as some kind of gauge transformation acting on psi, then we just take the same form and apply it on H A. Okay, that's the idea because the, what gauge transformation is doesn't depend on what function it acts on. Well, the integral point is this will give just mm -hmm. uh, delta function of y minus z. Yeah, you don't have to do this integral. Okay. You just get delta function of other. If you don't have these integrals, you will get some factors of delta 4 of y minus z and delta 4 of uh, x minus z and so on. Okay. So you can do it without the integrals. <coughs> is this clear? What? If you do just calculate this, so this, this is simple. Right? This will just be. R A T A on psi, right? and then you have to apply again psi replaced by psi phi, right? By using the same formula, right? and that will bring bring it here. R A T B of psi, right? so you get R A T B R A T A minus R A T A R A T B, right? And that commutator is what you have to figure out. Okay, that will fix also the signs and everything else. Okay. So next time we will complete this and we will prove that the action is indeed realistic. So you should just remember that two terms that are left over. Right? One of them is this, the other one is what came from the variation of C. Pardon? Yes. Yeah, so here you will, it will be reversed because in the sense that first when you vary, you get R A T A on psi, right? Now this is of course as a constant. The second variation, the phi d, will act on psi, right? So if this was b, right, this is RATB, then the RATD will act on the come on the right of that. Right? Because they are varying psi. In the opposite order, it will come in the reverse order, right? So that that that's one of the things you have to keep track of. That here it's coming as db, right? But when you think in terms of r of t, right, it will be in the reverse order. Because first it brings R A T A, and then you apply delta transformation of psi, so the R A T D will come on this side. Okay, but just try to do it carefully, and we'll see what answer we get. Okay, and that answer is what you have to substitute here with psi replaced by H. Okay. <coughs> Okay, so now we will continue tomorrow.